and I heard gunfire erupt from across the street, and it was just kind of welcome to the wild, wild west. We fought for three hours up and down, trying to get up the staircase, down, grenades going back and forth. M67 frag grenade in my hand. And it's like, one, two. <laughs> but after they kick one back at you, it's you have like, to. I have to do this. Right. Or they're gonna, we're all going to die. The Black Rifle Podcast starts now. So do people often refer to you as Jeremiah? Is that like the that's, main name that you go by, or do you a, do you go by other nicknames? Every once in a while, they call me Thumper. That was our call sign. Really? Yeah. But like you specifically? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but Jeremiah. Yeah. Jeremiah. Yep. Hmm. Workmen, do they often get you confused with people that do significant amounts of work? <laughs> or <laughs> uh, you know, once upon a time, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm how many doing. how many years do you do in the Marine Corps? Uh a little nine and some change. Yeah. yeah. Did you get out because of uh the injury yeah, or I was medically retired. What, what so what what happened? What was the injury? Um not to relive the yeah, worst no, day of your I, life. I'm just so wondering. I I took shrapnel up my right side, mm -hmm. but back, uh TBI, some, you know. Yeah. So. From a frag or from uh yeah. other shit. Yeah, we were uh you know, we got stuck in a house over there and uh, just yeah, tell eight, me, eight feet away. We're tell, lobbing. Tell me what happened because I've and, heard, I've read the citation. I know yeah. you probably don't want to talk about it, but I'd rather just to get straight into it because I yeah. read the citation. I want to know the before, the middle, and the end. Right. Like, how did you find yourself there? I mean, you're a security forces guy. Yeah. Were you, like, were you doing convoy escort? Were you so doing, I was so. So the way it worked was uh, I was on a security forces contract. So you uh -huh. do two years, you know, at a security forces duty station. Right. I was at Kings Bay, Georgia. <clears throat> when my two years was up, I rotated to Camp Pendleton, mm -hmm. <clears throat> joined 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, and 81-millimeter uh, mortar guy. Uh, went over there. I was a squad leader. And, you know, everybody always said, if you're if you're a mortar guy, you're going to be in the back of the vehicle playing spades or, you know, yeah. go goofing around. Right. And, uh, you know, after they opened Fallujah back up to the civilians to come back yeah. in, they're mm -hmm. like, okay, we're going to use you guys. You know, we're going to start going door to door and basically like a squeegee coming from the north of the city, just working our way south. Yeah. Picking up ammo. What year was this? Oh, four. Um, so you guys were in, so that was Fallujah, the second Two. round. Yeah. yeah. So for context, like for the for the audience that's listening, see so like Ramadi Fallujah one right. and then Ramadi Fallujah two, right. which Ramadi Fallujah two, I think was much worse than Ramadi Fallujah one. Yeah. They, you, you know, the Fallujah one and Ramadi one, um, a lot of politics came yeah. into play and they pulled everybody out. Mm -hmm. And all that did was give give the, the bad guys time to mm -hmm. hunker down and get ready for the big battle right. in November, November of 04. But, um, yeah, we just started, work, we were going door to door and, uh, I was actually across the street had to have, you know, seven or eight Marines with me we mm -hmm. were doing our thing and I heard gunfire erupt from across the street. Um, AK, you know, you, you know, the distinct, distinct different sounds and so, rattle, right? The rattle. And you're like, all right, what seemed like an eternity to me, it was like two seconds. I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, this ain't good. Right. You know? So I got the Marines that I had, we went across the street <clears throat> and it was just kind of welcome to the wild, wild west. You know, there was, I don't know for sure how many insurgents were in the house, but at the end of the day, I believe there were 40 dead insurgents. Um, in one house. In one house. We didn't know it at the time, but they were jumping, you know, yeah. how they're so close together, and mm -hmm. they're jumping from roof to roof to resupply and all that. But, uh, yeah, we had three Marines get stuck on the second story of this house. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, just, you know, it, it, if they weren't in there, we would have just pulled everybody out, dropped For the, sure. you know, been done with it. Yeah. Uh, but, obviously, we're not going to leave our – our brothers in there, so we fought for three hours up and down, trying to get up the staircase, down grenades going back and forth, and uh, you know we end up losing three Marines in that house, and uh, 
everybody was wounded. Did uh, you get the three Marines uh, out that you went over there to get? We did. And then were any of those guys KIA? Yeah. All, th- yeah. all three? All three. All three. All three. Yeah. So you didn't lose any of your Marines? Yeah. So, th- I mean, they were part of my platoon. Yeah. We just kind of, hey, Got it. you guys go on that side of the street. Mm-hmm. We'll cover this side of the street. Um, so we were all in the same mm-hmm. platoon, same. <clears throat> so you're in the same platoon. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it, it went on for three hours. Yeah. And you, you, three hours is a long you've been, you know, time. You know, you're running out of ammo. You got to come out. You're, you're getting more ammo. You're going in. Of course, comms aren't working. Right. Um, Tanks showing up. Once we actually got everybody out, we had, you know, the Abrams showed up, start mm-hmm. blowing their main gun into the front of the house. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, it it's it's one of those things that it, you know, it's hard to explain, but people say, you know, you're a hero, you're this. No, I I, I hate that word. I hate the word hero. Um I would like to believe that anybody in that situation would do the same damn thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I just call it taking the trash out. Right. You know, we had to we had to do what we had to do, and uh, unfortunately, we did lose three Marines. Mm-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's well. I think you know, without like, well, I mean, going going back, I think you know, as, as you start to look back on that time. And you you remember it? Does it give you anxiety when you remember it and think about it? Yeah, you know, yeah. I I, str- I was diagnosed with PTSD. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> I was a drill instructor at Paris Island when I was diagnosed. Came straight from Fallujah, straight to the drill field. Uh, probably not a good idea, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but yeah, looking back on it, it's uh, there's been a lot of nightmares. There's been mm-hmm. a lot of you know this things that we go through while we're processing what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I take away from it, and as the older I get, you know, I look back and I'm like, you know what? I, I witnessed things that day that it's hard to even put into words. Mm-hmm. You know, the selflessness, uh, the brotherhood, the camaraderie. <clears throat> People talk about it, but to, to see it in action yeah, and to see, like, this is what, this is what we do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've said it a thousand times since then that th- those Marines that I served with, they motivate me every day. You know, when I'm down on my luck or I'm feeling sorry for myself, I just think back to those Marines, you know, that paid the ultimate sacrifice. And I just hope that one day my son is as good as those guys were. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, it just keeps me going. Um, How old are your kids? Uh, my son's 16. My daughter's 13. Okay. Do you yeah. want him to join the Marine Corps? So my son wants to be a Marine pilot. Yeah. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> like fixed or, or, or he, you know, he's he seen Top Gun too many times. <laughs> yeah. <He's>, uh, <laughs> hey man, you can't, you know, <laughs> so, he, you know, yeah. hell, he, I, you know, we call them stick wigglers. He don't yeah. want to, you know, he wants to be the F-18, gotcha. F-35 yeah. type guy. Yeah. I can't blame him. Right. You know? But uh, he's looking at the Naval Academy. And okay. So, but yeah, you know, it's just, it's one of those things. I, I want him to, and I would be very proud, but my wife and I, we made it very clear. We will never push it. Yeah. We'll never. I mm-hmm. want him to make his own decision. So, but it would be pretty uh, tremendous. It would be pretty awesome to give him his first salute, you know. Yeah. Is it was your wife and Marie? No. No. no we're... My wife and I, high school sweethearts. Really? Yeah. Um, Little North Union High School back in Richwood, Ohio. 2,000 people in the town. I was a junior. She was a freshman. My locker was probably five down from hers. (laughs) You know, as we're in between classes, I'm fiddling with my lock, and I'm looking over, and I'm like, damn, she's pretty hot. (laughs) And, uh, yeah, we we just celebrated our 20th anniversary this past August. And... uh, you know, she's followed me around the world. She's been there. She's my rock. And uh, yeah, what year did you join the Marine Corps? I I I joined the delayed entry program uh-huh. in two thousand, okay. but I actually went to boot camp in August of oh one. So I was at Paris Island for nine eleven. Whoa, that's a whole nother. I mean, that was totally 
the weirdest thing. Yeah, what uh, what is that like? Because you're in Paris, you're you're in Paris Island during nine eleven. Like, yeah, everybody knows. So, I'll tell my nine eleven story when you tell your right. You yeah, go so first. mine was actually we were in line at the recruit barber shop to get our haircuts. I saw the barbers come running out, yelling, you know, we're under attack, we're under right, attack, right. and I'm like, what in the hell are they talking about? I, I'm like, hell, maybe somebody's attacking Paris Island. Yeah. <laughs> They march us back to the squad bay, and they're like, get your shit. You know, we're going down to uh, the colonel wants to talk to you. You know, recruits don't talk to <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, he told us what had happened, and uh, but it just it never seemed real mm -hmm. because we never saw it on TV. Yep. N no magazines, no newspapers. Mm -hmm. I graduated on November 16th. So you didn't see anything Nothing. from – that time until November. So okay. I go home on boot leave on November 16th, and obviously the country is still in mourning. Yeah. You know, it's fresh. Yeah. But it, I, I couldn't wrap my arms around it. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw, like, the replays and the, the videos of the planes hitting the buildings, and I'm like, what? What is it? Whoa, whoa. Right. Like, I just, it was weird because I, I was so removed from it. And, uh... It, it, yeah, it was just very. It was a, such an eerie thing. Um, so when you when you graduated, and then you know, obviously you, you showed up your first duty station. You guys are, I mean, everybody knew eventually you're going to get up in the. You're going to wind up in the show. Well, no, actually, we were actually kind of pissed because I, my first duty station was with security forces right. down at Kings Bay, Georgia. Yeah, Firewatch. Okay. You know, we're guarding nuclear submarines, and. Uh, <laughs> We didn't know if it was going to be like Desert Storm right. or is it, what, what is this? Yeah. And, but, you know, as young, motivated, hard chargers, we're like, we're upset. We're going to miss the show. Yeah. You know, and that's all we thought about. And uh, when I got orders from there to Camp Pendleton to join 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, I was I knew they were going. Right. And um, I remember sitting on my, my couch at my apartment in Oceanside, California, watching Fallujah 1 unfold right. on TV. Yeah. And I just remember, I'm like, I'm so pit. I'm going to miss it. Yeah. That's all I kept thinking. I'm going to miss this. And this is why I joined. And who would have, you know, obviously ended up in Phantom Fury. And right. So, you know, things work out in weird ways, but... Yeah, I remember. I thought I was. I was just remember being so pissed and irritated that it was. I was going to miss it. Do you wish you would have? No, no, no. You know, I. A lot of bad things happened. Yeah, but there was also a lot of great things that I saw. Mm -hmm. And like I said, the things that I what I take away from Fallujah is watching those Marines operate, mm -hmm. and it's just inspiring. And it just keeps me going. And, you know, something really, really bad happened. You know, and that's why when I when I got my Navy Cross, it's like there was a lot of hoopla and a lot of, you know, congratulations. Blah, blah. But <clears throat> it brought back a lot of bad memories for me. You mm -hmm. know, something really bad happened in order for me to receive that award. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't even wear it for probably the first month after I received it because I just felt so undeserving, weird feeling about it. Is there guilt? There was a lot of guilt back then. I, I have since come to terms mm -hmm. that not just me, but everybody that day did what we could. Mm -hmm. In fact, if we didn't do what we did, there probably would have been a lot more KIA. It's taken me many years to get to that point. But, yeah, at the time, I had a lot of survivor's guilt, you know. I, le I, I led these Marines. I was the first in the stack every time, and I and it's just mind-boggling to me. Like, the guy behind me takes an AK round through the shoulder. I'm like, how did that not hit me? Like, right. And, you, you know, you're always second-guessing and questioning stuff. And, the, you know, I just turned 40 last month, and I'm like, it's all starting to make sense. Like you just can't control, you know, you just, it happened. Mm -hmm. We, we did what we could. 
And uh, war is a nasty thing. And I think the thing that really bothered me the most for the longest time is talking to these Marines, <clears throat> talking to their parents before we deployed. It's like, I got your, you know, we're good. Right. I got them. Mm-hmm. And then to come back without them, that was tough to look at the parents. But, you know, like I said, I, I'm able to look back now and know that what we did that day probably prevented a lot. It could have been a hell of a lot worse. Mm-hmm. So That's interesting. I I read every other year. I read Helmet for My Pillow. And, you know, I mean, obviously, like, like uh, there's a couple different books out there that I think, you know, E.B. Sledge has written, you know, the, the China Marine, <clears throat> Helmet for My Pillow. Um, there's another one. I, I kind of go back because it puts things into context for me right. and in, in no other war story actually creates context for me in that way. Whereas like, I'm not in Peleliu. I wasn't there. Right. I wasn't, you know, in Oki. I mm-hmm. wasn't there. Those guys, it, it, it provides depth and dexterity to what I did and more, more importantly, some context to what they went through. Like, I think there was not, I I would say there was a lot of romantic romanization of war before I went. Right. And I have a fully new and more profound respect for, you know, the guys that, that went from Normandy and to, you know, all the way through Europe and then the guys that fought their way through Southeast Asia, like, fuck, it's unimaginable. Like, <clears throat> my war wasn't even close to their war. Like, Yeah, you know, I, I think about that a lot. My, yeah. my grandfather, um, World War II, and, you know, when when those guys, and got, when they left, they didn't, it was four or five yeah. years. Yeah. Um, if, if that happened now... I, I can't even, you know, we, we were on, you know, depending on what branch you were in. If you were a Marine, you did a seven-month yeah. pump, came back for, you know. Yeah. But you knew at some point you were going to come back and see, hopefully see your family. Right. When those guys left, there was no end in sight. Mm-hmm. And so you're right. It's um, like the only way home was. Victory. Like, yeah, it was either the million-dollar wound, right? Right. Like the, you know, victory or the fucking worst wound, right? Which right. is like in a, in a bag or, or missing right. limbs. Right. Or, you know, hopefully, because I mean, a lot of those guys, like they're keeping their fingers crossed, like hoping I just get the the good one, you know, like the through the butt cheek, it doesn't right. hit anything. Right. <laughs> like, Yeah. You know, it, I met, uh, this is years ago, um, I met a lot of guys from Iwo Jima. There was, yeah. there was an Iwo Jima uh, convention there in D.C. And I was a young sergeant, probably, mm-hmm. you know. But to sit there and to hear the stories, and it, it just gives you goosebumps, you know. Mm-hmm. It's like, man, they... Whew. And and not knowing if you'll ever go home. Mm-hmm. It just, it's mind blowing. It's- I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think I really believed them, to be honest with you. I didn't believe them because I would talk to, you know, guys that were in Vietnam or World War II and there were phases, right? Like that could never happen. Right. Like that's crazy. Like no way. Right. And then you go. Right. And you're like, oh, yeah, that mm-hmm. can happen. I remember. It clicked for me. I, I was talking to a guy one time, a Vietnam MACV guy back early, early on. He was telling me about how he 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 called in an airstrike on a battalion of North Vietnamese and he like just napalmed an entire side of a mountain and just like cooked right. a battalion. Right. Right. And he just like he was he was sitting on a, you know on an op with a group of other guys and he was watching a battalion just burn to death in right. the middle of the jungle like, and I was like ah oh, really, and then I and then 
going and right. then seeing the the full power, like because you don't have the actual dexterity of what true combat power looks right. like until you're part of the machine, right. then it scares the shit out of you <laughs> because it is so incredibly powerful. Like the right. invasion watching watching MLRS like really clack off for the first time or right. watching like, you know, mortaring a city after city, like like, right. like for hours and hours. You're like, okay, this is no, this not only did this happen, now I think they turned the volume down on their on their stories to some degree because right. seeing it is different. Yeah, yeah I, there was a movie, um, I think Flags of Our Fathers, and then they did yeah. the version that was from the Japanese standpoint. Mm -hmm, yeah. And I don't know if you remember the part where they look out the Japanese and they see all the warships out there. Yeah. And they're basically like, oh, fuck. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's here. Yeah, it's here. And you're right. I mean, I, I couldn't, I mean, I'm just glad I was on, you know. I'm just glad I was on that side. Right. right? Like I, I thought about that a lot where what would it have been like to be on the other <sighs> side? Like I would have been fucking scared out of my <laughs> mind, man. Like I, I, I couldn't imagine like the first time that I saw a no shit, a company of Marines and the firepower a company of Marines, right. a, a company of Marines would bring to a gunfight. Right. It was wild. Yeah. I was like, that, this is wild, man. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, we were like, we had four gun trucks, you know, a couple of 50 cows and right. like, you know, things were loud, but they weren't like, <laughs> you put a company of Marines yeah. and you let a bunch of eight pissed off 18 year old, like kids cut loose. And Dude, it them, is wild. Yeah, let them do what they've yeah. been trained to do. It's yep. like taking a leash off a Doberman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's like, whew, shit. Yeah, it's, yeah, it, it, it's been pretty amazing over the last 20 years. Um, John Ripley, I don't know if you've heard that name. Mm. Uh, there's a book that was written about his. Um, what he did in Vietnam called Ripley at the bridge. Uh -huh. It's the bridge at Dong Ha. He stopped like monkey bar style swinging under this bridge. Uh, oh yes. Oh like, my gosh. Yes. 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 So one thing that I will always cherish is our family, my wife, my kids weren't around, uh -huh. but uh, we got to be friends. No way. Really? And uh, we, we would go out and spend Thanksgiving with his family out in Radnor, Virginia, out in the middle of the mountains. And uh, his sister, I remember we're all sitting around Thanksgiving after dinner, you know, everybody's. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I remember her saying, you know, we hadn't heard from John in a long time. But it was like Walter Cronkite in the evening news. And there's this Marine running, carrying his M16. And the whole time there's, Hawkmar, you know, he's getting yeah. shot at. And his sister goes, that's John. Their mother come running in and said, where? And she said, that is my John boy. They knew. But they were so, they were scared shitless because he was getting shot at. But they were so thankful to see him alive. And, uh, I mean, if you, if you read this, you know, he, he, and what's really crazy about it is once he got all the, the explosive yeah. set, yeah. it didn't go off. You have a division of NBA <laughs> yeah. firing on this bridge while he's doing his thing. He had to go back and find where yeah. the, where it was not connected and then blew – he stopped a whole division himself. The, he got a Navy Cross, which I think is – yeah, you know, the Marine Corps screwed up on that one. Should have been a Medal of Honor. Uh, but to get to know him and his family the way we did is something I will cherish forever. I mean, it's just. Is he still alive? No, he passed uh, probably 12 years ago. Okay. Yeah, he's he's a he's a legend. I he, I, I had uh, our, our uh, Coffee or Dies, our blog, we did a couple stories on him specifically on mm -hmm. for that because it's such an incredible story. Yeah, it, you know when I when I got to know him, he was getting older. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
What did he do after he got out? Was um, I think he spent most of his time either teaching or instructing yeah. there at the Naval Academy. Right. Uh, when he passed, he still lived in Annapolis. Did he really? Yeah. Um, when you walk into the main hall at the Naval Academy, there's a diorama, you know, the bridge at Dong Ha. Mm-hmm. Every, it, it's like John Ripley. Wow. It's like the, it's like a Catholic meeting the Pope. Right. You know, and uh, I just remember I'm seeing him as he's getting more feeble and he's getting older. Hey, man, don't mess with that old dude. That guy will kill you. Like I just in my mind, I'm like he right. is. He is a warrior, right? You know, and it was just, it was so awesome. I'm so glad I got got to meet him and his family and share those memories with his sisters. And but yeah, it's and that's probably been one of the greatest things about the last 20 years is I've gotten to meet so many people that. It gives you goosebumps mm-hmm. when you hear what they did. Yeah. And you're like, Phew, man. Uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not worthy. <laughs> like, I just, and he's definitely one of them, you know. And uh, it's just, it's been a crazy journey. Yeah. What's uh, it, what do you do, like, like, as you, you know, you get out of the Marine Corps and, you know, as you're trying to kind of like, I guess, become a civilian like what's <laughs> well what, yeah so what, what's that like well it really sucked because i had i wanted to make a career out of the marine corps yeah and uh one day you're a marine the next day you're on a med board mm-hmm. and that's essentially it's the same as getting your walking papers yeah you no know, it's like up oh, you're done mm-hmm. shit what am i gonna do so i started working for the va <laughs> did you really i did I spent, it was either 10 or 11 years mm-hmm. I was there. I was out based from D.C. to Quantico. Mm-hmm. And uh, for probably the first five or six years, I really enjoyed what I was doing. What were you doing? All the Marines and sailors at Quantico that were, had been put on a med board, mm-hmm. um, I filed their VA claims for them. That way, when they got through the med board, when they left the service, they weren't waiting two years to get right. their benefits. Right. They walked out with their benefits in hand. Yeah. And I've... And I know we saved lives. Yeah. You know, because you leave, you're in financial trouble, you're fighting with the VA. So I felt really good about what I was doing. The problem is, after five or six years, and I feel like it's anything with the damn government, the bureaucratic red tape bullshit, I couldn't help people. Yeah. Like a young Marine come into my office, it's like a very simple fix, but I'm not allowed to do it because mm-hmm. it's not. It's not in the the SOP or, right, you know, yeah, yeah. I'm like, it's so simple. Let me fix this. Right. No, you can't do that. So, and it was just more and more of me banging my head on the wall. Like, what in the hell do these people, tru- like, do they care about veterans? Right. Or are they just here collecting a paycheck? Mm-hmm. And after, it was when COVID hit, I came home from work. You know, I sat in a lot of traffic over there on 95. Yeah. And, uh. I walked in the door. I looked at my wife. I said, we're moving home. She goes, what do you mean? I said, we're going to Ohio. She said, well, what are you going to do for work? I said, I don't know, but I'll figure it out. We sold our house. We packed our shit. We (laughs) we moved home to Ohio. (laughs) And, uh, you know, I've I've been dabbling in different things, private security, uh, sales and things of that nature. But, yeah, it just, it was very difficult, that transition. Mm -hmm. Not because I couldn't adjust. You know, I'd been in enough social situations I could handle myself in any situation like that. Right. It's just I want to do something that's meaningful, and I know that I'm making a difference. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to find. Yeah, it is. It re- I mean, it really is. And uh, for somebody to give you the the access or the authority to say, you know what, go do good things. Not you can't do that, you know. You, right. You know, Meanwhile, you know, we've lost however many people to suicide and things because of stupid shit mm-hmm. that I, a lot of it I think we could have. What do you think, like, from the stupid shit perspective, I mean, seeing it for all those 
years. I'm not asking you to be, right. you know, like critical, but like be objective in, in the criticism. Yeah. Because I, I mean, there's a huge percentage of vets. I, I get these DMs all the time. Like, you know, I've, I, uh, you know, I've been dealing with this injury. I can't get a, I can't get this through the VA. I, I just had one last night at nine thirty, and I always respond because I, I'm, I'm super concerned most of the time around you know people's psychological health right. and whether or not they're going to take their own lives. Right. And like that's a, it's a big concern. It's obviously a pressing priority. Mm -hmm. So I always tell them, I'm like, get a VA advocate. Like you know, if you're trying to do it yourself, sometimes that's not it's tough. Yeah, it's tough. I believe, first of all, I believe that when the wars broke out in 03, I don't think we, and I say we, the DOD, mm -hmm. was prepared for when we came back. Right. I believe they're doing a hell of a lot better now. Mm -hmm. But at the time, it was total chaos. I mean, when you came back, you were turning your rifle into the to the armory and there was a corpsman standing there picking his nose or doing whatever he was doing. Are you having any issues? Well, who would say yes right. when it's going to prevent you from seeing your family? Mm -hmm. Nobody. You know? So I think we've figured a lot of that out, but a lot, you know, the VA and I truly, I honestly don't believe there's anybody that works for the VA that wakes up and says, I'm going to work to screw over a veteran. I don't believe that. Yeah, you're right. But I do know that there's people that their give a shit factor is very low. Mm -hmm. They've never served or whatever the case may be. They just, they don't get it. Right. And, and you probably know, you know, I need help. Well, call, call this number the, the suicide prevention number. Well, how can you call the suicide prevention number and get put on hold? Yeah. Just stupid shit. And it's like, one hurdle after another, one hurdle after, and I do believe they've gotten better. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to be critical; I'm just being completely honest. I worked there for ten, eleven years. Mm -hmm. um, not enough uh, manpower, you know. You name it. There were so many things going on, but I do, I do think we're we're getting to we're getting there. I don't quite understand, and maybe you can explain it to me. Why, why, why are there? Why is there two different systems? So, uh, for instance, in this is you know when I get out of the, the the army, I have my medical records, right, and then I have to go to the VA to get a disability rating, right. It, I never quite understood why there's a separation of church and state from that regard, which would be, I, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I. The only thing that I can think of is if that. If that responsibility fell onto the branch mm -hmm. or the DOD, yeah, I don't know that it, anything would. I mean, <laughs> I, and I, hey, that's fair. You yeah. know, the, the, yeah, yeah. The, the, we'll just call it the green machine is mm -hmm. here for one reason, yeah, and that's to locate, close with, and destroy the enemy. Right, that's yep. what we're here for. Yep. So I am. Part of me is glad that there is a separate federal organization that's there to do that. Right. It's just if you're going to do it. You got to have the amount of people there that can do it. You got to right. have people there that give a shit. You got to, right. and I like I said, I think we're getting there. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think politics plays a huge part in it. Yeah, you have one, uh, you know, administration that does this, the next does that, and it's like every time some starts to get into a good rhythm, it's like, oh, new administration, we're going to do this. Yeah, I just. And a lot of people don't realize the VA is the second largest federal agency in the country. Yeah. I mean, there's like 300,000 employees. Right. Um, What's the first? Do you know? DOD. D oh, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 So any anytime you're dealing with that amount of, you know, people, you're going to have the red tape and the yep. bureaucratic bullshit. So, but I do. Like I said, I think... Um, you go back to 03, 04, 05, well, hell, even clear up to 09. Yeah. It was a mess. It was a mess. It really was. I mean, yeah. there's no other way to describe it. <laughs> I do believe that they've gotten better. You know, if we can't get you in at the VA within 30 days, we're going to send you to an outside provider. Right. Why did it take 10 years for somebody to figure out that that's right. what we need to do to get people help? Yeah. You know, but- 
we're getting there. And, what do you struggle with physically more than anything now? You know, f- physically, it's uh, typical, and I, I hate to sound like a whiny, uh-huh. like infantry <laughs> dude, but, you know, angles, knees, back. Um, but you learn to live with it. You know, uh-huh. I, I refuse to take pain medication. Yeah. The strongest thing I'll take is to leave. Same. You know, so, but you learn to live with it. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, I finally just had my shoulder operated on. I got to a point I couldn't throw the football with my kid. Right. And I'm like, I got to do something. Yeah. Uh, my running days obviously are over. <laughs> I can't, you know, I'm just, the last time I tried to get into a good PT program, yeah. get running and everything, <clears throat> I ended up in the hospital because of the amount of pain. Yeah. yeah. And. Like what happens? Is it like your back mainly? Back, yeah. Lower back. And, yeah. uh. I had a jump school ankle injury. Mm-hmm. And, and when you're 22, 21 years old and jump, doesn't matter, you're like, yeah, whatever. But you know, and the doctors and all the adults in the room are like, you know, that's going to turn to arthritis when you're 40. Right. Well, shit, I'm 40 and I, it hurts. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, you know. it, it often echoes in my head, like rents come and do motherfucker, mm-hmm. you know, like that, that goes in my head where I'm like, oh man, all those yeah. like, Every time I would just like step out and suck it up every time. Like I never went, I never saw, you know, I never went to medical. I never saw shit. Like there's nothing you, you couldn't get me to do any of that ever. Unless it was like, I could not perform at all. Right. Which would be like pneumonia. And even then, or whatever it was, it was like, I broke both my hands one time and my back. So I broke both my hands, my back, and my right foot. And I was finished work that day. And I drove <laughs> myself to the again. I drove myself to the hospital. Right. And, and it was like, like on Fort Lewis McCord. And I drove oh over there God. and they're like, yeah, you have two broken hands, a broken foot, a tailbone. Yeah. And I was like lifting shit and like putting stuff away. But I was like, I finished work. And then I drove myself over there. Right. Well, you, uh, but as you know, the culture, <laughs> it's like, don't be that guy. Don't be the guy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, don't sick quit. commando, whatever the hell you call yeah. it. It's like, don't be that guy. No, because yeah. that guy, <laughs> like, that guy was like, I don't, we all know that guy. It's like, we used to call him uh, Chinese jump boots. You remember that? Was, uh, like those, uh, <laughs> those boots that they'd have to wear if they got, like, for hairline fractures or right. whatever. Because And that was all the dudes were like, they were just weak, right? We were, we were looking at those guys like, you just can't suck it up. Yeah, man. You're, like, you're... you're it, it always, uh, the movie Heartbreak Ridge, when the lieutenant's yeah. like, I would join you in the field, but I've got a dental appointment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. every platoon had one. Yeah. It's like, don't be that guy. You're you're just, so yeah, I mean, anybody that's worth a shit sucks it up. You don't go to medical. You get out, and next thing you know, you're 40, and you're like, damn. Damn. I feel like I'm 80. Yeah, I'm 46. <laughs> and I you know, I'm 46, man. And I'm like, it's, it's, it's constant for me. Like I just had a, um, it's a calcification, uh, cardiac scan to see what my, like where, if there's any buildup in my right. heart, I don't have the results back yet, but yeah, it's 70 bucks. Right. You go in, you can see what, what's going on because all every, every male in my family's died of a heart attack, right. you know, but I was thinking about this yesterday. I'm like getting into this machine. I'm like, <laughs> you know, like to get my heart scan. I'm like, to be fair, like I've done, you know, I've chewed a, a, a dump truck loaded fucking Copenhagen in my life, right? Like <laughs> I've, I've tried to kill myself multiple times with liquor. I've had a very stressful life, you right. know, like from, you know, multiple deployments to, you know, starting this coffee company. Right. I drink, you know, a, a, a tanker load of caffeine every day. I, if this thing isn't like, right. <laughs> like right. ready to blow up, I don't know what is. Like just come like exploding right. out of my chest. Yeah, it's. <laughs> <laughs> every, and I wake up in the morning right. and like everything pops and whines oh, and you know, hurts. I, I joke with my wife. I'm like. You know, I, I just hope I don't tear my ACL getting out of bed. In the <laughs> it's like, you know, I slept on the pillow wrong and I'm down for two days. Yeah. Because I got a kink in my neck. Yeah. Like, 
But yeah, no. But you know what? We we laugh and we we're joking about it, but um, it just I I try to keep it in perspective. You know, like I got all my limbs. Same. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. I'm I'm able to wake up, be a dad, be a husband. Um, and I just you know you think about those that didn't make it back, and it's like, man, we're pretty damn lucky. You know, we're just, yeah. I'm just glad to be vertical. Same. I I think about it every like every night that I've had kids, I can, right. I, I was sad, you know, I've had, a, I, I had a significant amount of survival guilt, like survival guilt. Um, you know, I think that the anxiety, you know, necessarily, not necessarily PTS, just like high levels of anxiety right. for no reason at right. times where you're like, why, what? what? I don't yeah. quite understand that, but I don't have some of the other things. Like, like I sleep, like I just can't sleep in the context of I have like insomnia, right. but it's not, I don't have nightmares. Right. I just have insomnia. Like I'll be up and I can't go to sleep and I can't go to sleep till <laughs> four o'clock in the morning. And yeah. I, I don't know what the fuck is going on. And so, it doesn't matter. It's just, it doesn't matter. So I'm like, all right, well, I guess I'll work or play chess on, online. Right. Or, <laughs> you know, when you go to the doctor and they're like, Did you, are you sleeping good? Hell yeah. I got four hours last yeah, night. Yeah. They're like, what the hell? <laughs> Like that ain't good. No. Like but four hours of good sleep to me, you know, because a lot of us we just don't sleep. And mm-hmm. for me, I was telling Dave earlier, it's like I don't have nightmares. I I, I just don't sleep. Yeah. I. That's uh, that's my big problem is right? I don't sleep. Like I I, you know, when I do, like like man, if I get five hours in a row, are you kidding me? Like yeah, you feel I'm like doing you, fucking cheetah yeah. flips. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, right. it's like, oh, oh. yeah, this is great. Yeah. And, you know, I think those are the big issues that I, I wrestle with. It's like, man, I try to get as much sleep as I can. Like just trying to work myself up to just get eight hours, like just get eight hours. And, you know, I've got blackout curtains. I've got noise machines. I've got a cooling pad, you name it. Because <laughs> like when I start to focus on things, like I focus on them, like right. I can't, I don't sleep. It, I go through it. If I'm having a hard time sleeping, I won't even sleep in the same room right. with my wife because if she moves <laughs> a toe, yeah, you're I'm up. up. Yeah. And not only am I up, like I'm not only up, but I'm ready. Like I'm, I'm ready to go. Like yeah, it's you're, the you're lights thinking. are on. Like I'm fucking ready to go. That's exactly how it is at the, uh, at the workman Casa. Really? Yeah. I, and my wife, she's like, you're on the hamster wheel. I'm like, <laughs> I just, but you, I'll wake up at four in the morning. And I'm like, damn, I got to go here, here. I got to talk to, you know, and I'm just yeah. planning and I'm like, my mind doesn't shut off. It just wants to keep going. And yeah, so four or five hours of sleep, man. I'm like, I feel pretty damn good. Yeah, my mind feels good. I don't even, if I got eight hours, I don't know how I'd act. Dude, I feel like when I get eight hours, like I, <laughs> I feel great. I feel like right. myself. Right. I like most of the time, I, 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 for years, I was just like a zombie, like right. walking through life, like, you know, participating in it. And I think, you know, kind of going back to where, what, what I started at, it was like, like, you know, for, for years, I, I, I dealt with a lot of survivor's guilt. Yeah. And then my kids, my, my kids made me appreciate like what I have a thousand times more. Right. And it, it didn't accelerate because as a single guy with no kids, I didn't have it as much as right. like, where, what, well, no, I had it as it, more, but then I had kids and I was like, oh man, I feel so un, like really, really fortunate to have this, this life with my, with my children. Right. And I have, I get to go home and read them stories every night. I get to right. get up in the morning. I get to watch them eat. And then I get to hug them and right. be with them. And as a like, you know, really create these incredible bonds with these fucking special human beings. Yep. Outside of the military, I, I I I can't imagine having a deeper relationship with right. anyone because these are incredible moments. And then I, I think about it in the context of like, man, okay, I get to do this. Mm-hmm. I got all my fingers and toes. I yeah, fuck it. I get five hours of sleep right. or whatever it is. But dude, I'm here. We're here. I'm here. And so, and I got two little little kids right. that rely on me. And by the way, I got to be plugged in. I can't be a bag of shit. Right. I can't fucking, I can't like swim in a bottle and I can't lament over my buddies. I right. got to like plug in and be fucking present. That, that, 
you know, I, I was telling Dave on the way here, I said, you know what? My kids probably have saved my life, mm-hmm. you know? hundred um, percent. Like you said, we, we can't swim in a bottle. We, we, you got to be present. You want, and that's every day when I wake up, I'm like, I'm vertical. Yeah. My feet are on the floor. Another beautiful day. In yeah. Ohio. In Ohio. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the corn's growing. Yeah. The beans are yeah. growing. You know, it's like, I, I just, I've, I can't complain. I, I, no matter how bad of a day I'm having, and there are times where I got to stop and put myself in check. Yeah. I'm like, look, asshole, you're still here. You got two awesome kids. Mm-hmm. You got an awesome wife. You got friends, family. Quit bitching and live your life. Man, that's fucking good advice because I I can't tell you how many times, like countless number of times, I've had to be my own right. first sergeant. Right. Like I am 10 miles up my own ass. Like <laughs> right. suck it up, motherfucker. Right. It, it's game time. Right. Like you, you don't have a choice. Like kick like kicking my rack getting myself right. up like you you put a put a smile on your face positive professional and polite i don't give a shit like i don't give a shit if you're having a bad day right you know what you know Somebody your buddy doesn't get your right. buddy doesn't get to have a bad day right. he doesn't get any more of those right, right. so suck right. it up yep like in I tell myself every day, probably suck it up, Buttercup. I, yeah. It's it's like it's a con, it's an ongoing mantra of like mm-hmm. suck it the fuck up. <laughs> and honestly, it's one of the things I'm trying to teach my kids. Like, dude, it is a skill to right. tell yourself to just suck, suck it, it up. up. Yeah, you, you know because it's normal to have a bad day here and there. Yeah, it's it is. Um, but to just. We we can't have bad days when you got kids running around. You're thank God my son just got his driver's license. Um, I was starting to feel like the the town Uber. <laughs> like, fuck, I mean, so he's driving, uh, so it, it's lifted the you know. But um, yeah, it's like I don't have time to sit here and piss and pout about shit. Right. I got to be on my game. What do you think? What are the things that you think are problems? For our peer group, like from a from from a GWAT veteran perspective, you know, obviously you've taken a look at it, like our peers, and you've said, okay, these are the things that plague us. What are they? You know, that's that, that that's very tough because, like you, you got a, a message last night from somebody at nine thirty. I get those messages, and it's like, man, what? You know, I'm trying to put myself in their shoes, like me 10 years ago. What, you know, because yeah. I was going through shit. Yeah. It's like, what can I tell this guy to help lift him up? And, you know, I, and I, I can't put my finger on I don't know. I think some of it is just leaving the institution and becoming a civilian. Mm-hmm. Some people just can't do that. Yeah. You know, there's that piece. Yeah. Then there's the employment piece, like, Damn, I you know, I wore a uniform every day. I didn't have to pick out clothes. I yeah. didn't have to do shit. I just I knew what to do. Mm-hmm. Um, now I'm working in the corporate world or whatever I'm doing. And it's like, wow. I mean, it's, I think it's just the shock, shock and awe almost of transitioning from the military to the civilian world that a lot of people struggle with. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if you can find gainful employment or do something where you feel like you're engaged and that you're helping or you're, you know, but it's a good question. I, I have so many friends that got out of the Marine Corps and it's like, they're miserable. I mean, absolutely miserable. And I'm like, dude, your kid's playing high school football. You know, you got to come on, man. Like, yeah, I was like, I don't know. I don't know, you know, and everybody's different. You know, what worked for me doesn't work for him. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I can tell you one thing for me and I. Yeah. What's worked for you. Yeah. So I've done every type of therapy there is, you know, on this planet. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
what really worked for me is when I finally, a lot of people were like, do you pray? Do you, are you a believer in, in the Lord? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. But did I really, I started praying about stuff and it's so soothing for me and it just, and it may not work for somebody else, mm-hmm. but for me, when you've done, when you've taken every medication on, on the planet, when you've done all the different therapies, the hyperbaric oxygen chain, you name it, I've done it. Mm-hmm. Going to bed at night and praying for another great day. Yeah. Please allow me to have another one. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it just, that's for me, you know. Um, I tell people that. Some people take it mm-hmm. and run with it. I'm like, man, you know what? I feel like I just got an elephant off my chest. Mm-hmm. It, but it don't work for everybody. You know, I was like, I wish I could fix. That's my thing. Like, I wish I could fix everybody that's having issues. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's why I wrote Shadow of the Sword. Um, I felt like because you know people don't raise their hand in our line of work. People don't raise their hand and say I've got issues. Right. We just don't do that. Yep. So I thought. You know what? If I write this book and me being a Navy Cross recipient and the Marine Corps had me on this pedal stool mm-hmm. and everything, if I can write this book showing people, letting them into my world and my struggles, that it's okay to raise your hand and get help, if I can help one person out there, then it was worth it. Mm-hmm. And I can't tell you how many people, that book came out in 2009. I cannot tell you how many messages I've gotten, not only from veterans, but wives, mothers, aunts, uncles. Thank you. You saved my kid. I'm like, it gives me goosebumps. Yeah. But I'm like, that's why I did it, you know, because people feel alone and that's the, they get isolated. Yeah. And so, yeah, the, I've seen this with with a, a huge category of my friends, which is they get out, mm-hmm. right? So whether they retire, a lot of guys right now, they're retiring right. because, you know, we, they got in at 18 and, you know, 22, whatever it is, I'm 46. So my peer group of guys, are they're retiring. Right. And, um, you know, a lot of them transition over to, you know, work at the CIA or right. D- DIA or one of the other IAs, let's yeah. call it what, you know. <laughs> yeah. And then some of them transition to do something completely different. Right. Um, but I've seen where I think I find if personally where I find it most like beneficial for me is like just being around other vets, like just being around other guys where you like can say, people. yeah, just like I can't imagine – getting out and then being alone, like being alone in the corporate world where there's no other buddy, there's no one else out there that we can, you can have a conversation with around like, yeah, you know, like he, like like the conversation we just had, like we don't have fucking, we both have four or five hours of sleep a night. (laughs) Like I'm not having nightmares. I just can't sleep. sleep. And then go, hey dude, what are you doing for this? Like, what are you doing for this? And- Unfortunately, I think a lot of guys, they, they, they detach themselves from their tribe, especially when it's a warrior-driven culture or the warrior-driven right. tribe. And then they go and they put themselves with a bunch of, we'll call it grass eaters, right? Mm-hmm. Or what I lovingly refer to as seed sorters. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's like, yo, man, you're... You're <laughs> digging yourself out of like the hunters and you're going to live with the seed sorters by yourself. And you're like talking about how you guys remember what it was like to like, you know, fucking crush people in the field of battle. And they're all like, no, we just sort the seeds, man. Right, what are you talking right. about? And you're like, but do you remember how fucking cool that shit was? <laughs> like what? <laughs> no, man. Like I'm really good at <laughs> right. color differentiation right. so we don't die right. by eating the wrong berries. And you're like, this is fucking dumb, dude. <laughs> I don't do that. It's fucking crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. That, you know, true. and the thing is like you leave, I don't know, let's say Bragg or Pendleton yeah, yeah. and you leave and you go back to, Smallville, USA, 
like you said, there's nobody there that nobody there. shares the same, you know, nobody there that ate the same shit sandwiches as you did. <laughs> and, you know, like in Richwood, Ohio, I'm the commander of the local VFW. Yeah. But there's three of us that are actually veterans. Really? I mean, it's, yeah, they're, they're all uh, social members oh, or, right. you know, but, yeah, but it's yeah. a small... T- but luckily for me, like, you know, we've been talking about, I, I keep busy with my kids and my wife and this yeah. and that. But there are those that go back and they're isolated. Yeah. They don't have it. You know, it's like, fuck, you got to get out of there. I That's the thing I love about, like, my the, my company is, right. like, dude, I come through here and it's, like, I got, you know, former E9, right. ESAR major over here, former E7, former right. this, former that. Like, yeah. at the end of the day... All of us are basically, especially enlisted guys, we're basically just fucking E5s, right? We, we, yeah, we, we, <laughs> we, we grow up, we have like more, you sort know, of. sort of, you know, <laughs> but I mean, you know, it, like nobody really likes to be around the guy that was a real sergeant major because he's a piece of shit. He's an asshole, right? He's right. like, oh man, look at these uniform standards. Hey, dude, like nobody likes you. you nobody, haircut? Yeah, yeah. Nobody like was into that, right. by the way, is any fun whatsoever. Right. Like right. it's like, ah, fuck, you remember that? Like, and so <laughs> I I can cruise around here and like make really fucking uh, just egregious statements about fuck crazy shit. Right. And people are like, <laughs> that's funny. And by the way, <laughs> they, they st- it's still kind of like being in a team room, right? You're like, ah, it's still kind of being in a team. And I remember, I, and I don't know who in the hell said it, but I remember hearing a SAR ma- a good SAR major say, no crack drill team from 8th and I ever killed anybody at Gob. <laughs> and I'm like, he's a good one. Like, that's true. You know, because they're walking around, they're like, get your thumb along your trouser seams, you nasty mm. thing. And it's like, Dude, just shut the hell up, man. We want to go do real shit. I used to always think about that. When I, I, I was thinking about like, wouldn't it be cool if we were, was like, you could, you could, you could take two different militaries, right? And the Marine Corps could recruit all those guys that wanted to be like show ponies, like <laughs> just like you know, hey, ho, hey, 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 you know, like wearing all their fucking cool shit. And then you have like all the fucking. Dirty, nasty combat guys are like we. They don't do any of that show pony shit. Right. But the show ponies, like they just like they do all that stuff back home. They're all like talking about uniform regs and doing all their cool stuff. And then you got all the guys over here. They're like oh, yeah. fucking beards Break and like glass and yeah. Of war. <laughs> they're just like we're just like <laughs> right. really incredibly like, let them off the leash. Yeah, just let them off the leash. Like they just live out there. <laughs> Like maybe they have their own yeah. island. Like yeah. who the fuck knows? I, I can't but, tell you how many times I've heard, you know, he wasn't a real good garrison <laughs> marine. But my Ooh, God, man. you should have seen him over in Iraq and Afghanistan. He was the. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> that's what we want. Yeah. Like I want somebody that's going to kick the door down and do, some, you know, give somebody the business. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, and you can see those guys. The interesting thing is. Like later, yeah, later in my career, you'd always be, you'd always like be able to figure out real fast, like who, who you could depend on right. in a gunfight, right? right? Like you'd be like, oh, that guy, nah, it's like, you'd say, there's all like common personality traits where you're right. like, yeah, okay. Yeah. So you're, <laughs> you are who you are. Yeah. <laughs> Starts with a P, ends with a Y. <laughs> like <laughs> that's who you are. Got it. And, and you can spot them. A mile you can away. spot them. You can. I mean, I, it's. I used to talk about that where I was like, "Hey, man, if you can't be honest with me today, right? Just like point blank, punch right. me in the face with the truth. How the fuck are you going to step out of a car and like shoot back when things fucking matter? Right. It's like if you can't do that, it doesn't matter. So yeah, you might not like my attitude. You might not like me. You might not like the way I talk. You might not even like as like open and candid right. as I am all the time. Right. But at least you know, I'm not going to step out of a car and freeze up and be like, right. oh my gosh, I got to, Oh, I, or I, what I was like is like, there's. I was in a scenario one time where there was a guy really trying to fill the radios. Like he was really focused on filling radios with the back of things were going. Like yo, hey man, like chill out with those radios, dude. Like come come in and participate in this. Like come get some. Come get some, dog. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> yeah, you. Like, this uh, is don't me. Don't worry about those radios. <laughs> we got shit to do. Don't worry about that. Hey, man, if 
fuck them. Yeah. They're not going to help us. Like, oh, like no, call no. them if we need air support. That's yeah. a different system, man. That's Don't worry hilarious. about that other shit. <laughs> <That's> so <funny. laughs> it's like, it is, it's though. It's true, though. It's like, yeah. dudes all of a sudden find some work to do that is yeah. not relevant behind the, behind the confines of cover. <laughs> I'll be over here filling sandbags yeah. with the CP. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it's true. It's true. Like, oh, well, I got something in my eyes. Like, well, no, you don't. You don't got anything in your eye. <laughs> oh, it's so true, though. Yeah. Like, I, I'm, I'm wondering, like, if you think back on that, on that day, when, when you, when you put yourself back into that, into, into those moments where you're like, did you think of, about it when you were doing it, like this is fucking crazy. Like I shouldn't be doing this. Like I'm gonna die. Did you think those I, thoughts? Yes, I. <laughs> there, there. It got to a point that day where I started to lose. I tell people, it was, I was looking through like a straw this big, right, and it was getting smaller, smaller, smaller. And then I went black. I thought I died. And I was at peace. I was there with my boys. Right. Doing what I wanted to do. Well, then my battalion XO slapped the shit out of me and woke right. me up. And I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I just, people ask that, you know, all the time. Like, would you do it again? You know, what, what were you thinking with it? It was great. It's not normal to have somebody no. firing a belt-fed machine gun from 10 feet away at your face. Right. It's not normal. How I lived and everybody else got shot, I can't answer it. I don't know. I mean, I feel, th thank God. I, I mean, I was hit with three grenades. Right. But they were all the, like the homemade. Bullshit. Bullshit. More, yeah. There was more fuel in it than there was. Shrapnel. Oh, right. So it looked kind of like a Hollywood type explosion. A lot of right. flame and everything, but yeah. not the punch. Yeah. And that's probably what saved me. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I do remember thinking, I'm not, none of us are coming out of here. Right. I, honest to God, I did not think nobody would come out of there alive. Um, and I had, like I said, I had made peace. Um, I was there with my Marines and, how many frags you have on you when you stepped in there? Um, I probably had two or three, yeah. and you know I had eight Marines and a corpsman, and right with I was at the top of the stairs, and they were literally like passing them to me, right. And I'm just chucking grenades, and then you know they're like milk it because they kicked one back. Yeah, okay. I'm like fuck, I've heard about this. Yeah, <laughs> you know as all yeah. this is going on, yeah, yeah. you're trying to like go back to training, like. Basic shit. Yeah, cook it off. Cook it off. So what's that like? Oh, that was one of the weirdest feelings. I'm holding this yeah. M67 frag grenade in my hand. And it's like, one, two. <laughs> you know, it's like, I got to, fuck. Yeah. You know, but... <clears throat> Like that, that, that is like something that nobody will experience yeah. unless you've been in a, in right. a, in a but no after shit they, grenade fight. Right. But after they kick one back at you, it's you have like, to. I have to do this. Right. Or they're going to, we're all going to die. Yeah. So, so what you think you actually held on to it for two seconds? I, Were you like one, one thousand, two, one thousand? No, I, <laughs> I think like, it was a one, one two. <laughs> yeah. I think it was, I, it was a fast count. Yeah. You know, because. With the small arms fire going yeah. on and everything, and it's like, oh my god! I <laughs> and the guys, like I said, dude, like, milk that mother. Well, I and used I'm to, like, ah. I used to think about that all the time. Right. Where I was like, I fucking hope I am never in this circumstance. <laughs> right. And thankfully, it was never that circumstance. <sighs> but I was like, I never want to be in a situation where I have to cook <laughs> one of these off. I mean. Oh. And it's it would be the worst feeling on the planet. And you know what? I did I wasn't thinking this in the moment, but like after the fact, I'm like, you know, this was built by the lowest. Bidder. Yeah, that's what I always thought about. It's like, like, what if they didn't get the timing right? Like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Mm, fuck. 
That's so, that's <laughs> what I used to always think about because I'd like you know be hucking grenades or yeah. whatever, and I'm like, how do we know for sure? Yeah. That and knowing my luck, like thinking about Murphy's law. By the right. way, Murphy's law is right. like oh, I would have thrown three frags before. Now I got to cook them off, and knowing my luck, I'm gonna get the fucking one. <laughs> it's, it's like, boom. Yeah. Yeah. boom, or I'm gonna miscount Ugh. because you know you're in the space time continuum, and you're like one one thousand, two one thousand, but you don't know what real time is. <laughs> hey. It, it was, you know what, looking back, <laughs> when the, all the guys start yelling, cook that out of cook it, I'm like, I am, I am. <laughs> They're like, shut it, <laughs> you do it. <laughs> I'm like, because you're right, man. It's like, this was made by the lowest bidder. And, <laughs> and how do we know right. for sure? And I, I threw, I used to go out and throw frags like all the time because I was like, because that's that was the thought I used to always have was I don't throw enough grenades right. to really know not only not only know like do they have a delay but do I know I can actually put a grenade where I need to be able to put it so I used to throw grenades every day like I'd right. go out on the range like if we didn't have anything going on I'd go for a run and I would do like grenade tosses and shoot like left side right side right. I'd go fucking do a bunch of bunch of shit and shoot grenades and RPGs and fucking whatever. And I do all the guns because I'm right. like, I never know if I'm going to have to be shooting an AK on target, or maybe I might have an RPG and our guys carry RPGs. So I was like, I'll just fucking carry whatever. But dude, I used to always think of that. And I used to always think like, please, for the love of God, <laughs> never find me in this situation where I got to cook this fucking thing off. One of my buddies, oh, one of my buddies is in a car and they were get, they were in this like low vis armored car, and they were in Basra back in the day, and um, he got his thumb he's got his thumb shot off, and uh, and he had so they they had like a crowd of people around him, and they're and they were point blank shooting into this car with AK forty seven. So there's like three of them in there, and they're just turning this car into Swiss cheese. So armor's coming coming out, and they're like, we got one shot to get this thing like get out of here. Right. And they got to break, they got to break the seal and they got to throw this frag out, but they got to cook it off. <laughs> so he cuts it off inside the car, but then he gets his thumb shot off. As soon as he opens it three inches and he tosses it out, he gets his thumb shot off or one of his fingers, right? So he gets his fucking finger shot off the same time he's like dropping this grenade outside of an armored car, shuts the door, whoom, and then he gives him enough clearance right. to get out. And then he gets out with a saw and starts mowing a bunch of dudes down as he's like moving towards the QRF vehicle. But I'm like, so now you're sitting inside a car. You're getting, you're surrounded and you're, and, and you're getting guys that are like clacking, like just like rattling off AK, like point blank into right. the fucking armored vehicle. You got to open the seal. So you got to cook it off, open the seal. <laughs> There's, There's, a There's a lot of shit going on. There's a lot of shit going on. No, by the of, way, this is your one like, chance. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God, man. I, <laughs> that, it, you know, it's funny because I remember there are things that I remember very vividly from that day. Uh -huh. And then there are things that, you know, I'll tell, like, this is from my point of view. That's why I'm like, no, nah, no. Nah, remember what his name was there? And he did that. I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that. But the one thing I will never forget is when them they started passing the grenades. Yeah. And cooked the motherfucker. I'm like, oh, I knew. Oh, God, here we did go. Did you guys, so did you guys tape the tops? So did you tape your, uh, your, uh, your pins? So guys would take this and they'd take like a, a, uh, electrical tape right. and they would wrap one around the pin and then wrap it and then right. you'd have to pull it and you'd pull the whole thing out. You guys just had frags, exposed yeah. pins, no yeah. tape, right? No tape. Yeah. So we'd have like, we'd have tape. So like the first time I was like unwrapping this fucking grenade, <laughs> I was like, I'm never doing this again. Right. This is the dumbest shit. I don't know who fucking came up with this, but this is the dumbest shit I've ever done in my life. Yeah, they were even, I think at one point when we ran out of M67s, they were passing up uh, like flashbangs. Oh yeah, yeah. Those but like it, 
at the time, it, I didn't give a shit. What? Yeah, who cares? If it went boom right. and made a noise and was loud. Yeah, yeah. It would at least keep their head down long enough for us to put some smaller, you know, some yeah. suppression fire. And it was two or three bedrooms. Right. We were at the top of the stairs, and there were bedrooms that they were firing out of. So, you know, and I was remembering back to, like, school of infantry when I'm a private. Yeah. And, you know, you go to the grenade range. And like you said, he's like, you know, pull, pull. And throw <laughs> and you're yeah <laughs> the, and the like, arm out the, yeah the, and you go to throw it and you're like damn that's actually heavier than it seems so you I, at least for me the first one i threw i'm like man i look like a freaking jackass <laughs> like, <laughs> you're concerned with the way you look from yeah, like, I'm like, it, you're didn't, like ah, it didn't nearly go yeah, as far as i thought yeah, it would so the yeah. next time i get up there and i'm like damn i threw it over the damn thing so all this shit's like running through my head but Thank God that day it was better. All, all I had to do was get it in the doorway. Right, right. Just throw that son of a bitch in the doorway and let it do its thing. Right. <laughs> and then one came back. They kicked one back, blew us down the stairs. And uh, like I said, at, at that point is when I thought I was gone. You know, because I, I felt it hit my leg. Oh, shit. And uh, I was sitting, I'd like sitting against the wall. XO slaps the shit out of me. When I came to, I was throwing up all over. Uh, I think it was a mix of adrenaline and just dehydration yeah. and all kind. I mean, you. Know. But I do remember, like, I'm still friends with Todd Todd DeGrosier. Um Like, man, I I th that I was at peace, man. You had yeah, to go yeah. there and fuck it up. <laughs> Thank God, but. When he woke me up, I'm like, I'm still in this fucking hellhole. You know, that's what I just remember yeah. thinking, like, oh, I'm still, oh, God. But it felt like I sat there and was sulking for, like, 30 seconds, but it was probably five seconds, and I right. got back in the fight and, kept, you know, we kept doing our thing, so. Do you still keep in contact with most of those guys? Yeah, I, I talked to a, Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's tough. You know, some some guys are not doing as well as right. you would hope, and things like that. But, um, like, in what way are they like uh, dealing with depression? Yeah, and, yeah, men or, mental yeah. health stuff, and it's like you know, there's no magic wand, there's no magic pill. No, um, ever. And I said earlier, everybody's different. Mm -hmm. You know, therapy one on one may work for these guys. It didn't help me at all. Mm -hmm. You know, so. I would tell guys, I'm like, I'll tell you like a couple of things that I know for a fact, like alcohol has never helped anyone's anxiety or PTS period. It's never done anything for anyone. It's never done fact. anything for, it is a fact. It is a fact. It is a fact. Uh, one of my closest friends, he committed suicide last year, actually almost to the day. And I, I haven't drank since, right? Because like you don't, when you, when you have a, we have a brain injury and right. you have kind of a brain injury on top of, we'll call it, um, you know, a, a stew of toxicity in the right. sense of like, maybe you add some chemicals to it and some alcohol, you don't know what you're going to come up with. Right. And I know for a fact, I don't need it. I don't need it to live. It doesn't make my life better. It right. doesn't do anything for me. You know what it does? I've seen it fucking ruin, a lot. like ruin, right. end lives, ruin right. families, like right. wreck people's entire ability to look at things positively and like right. look at their kids and connect into their families. It doesn't do anything for me. I'm not sitting here by the way going like everybody needs to stop. I'm just right. saying like I don't find benefit to it and I don't want to run the risk of jeopardizing time with my fucking family, right. or time with my friends. And yeah. And and you know there was there was a time with 15 20 years ago where we did look to alcohol to we we thought it was right. hell you know but i agree with you i'm at a place in my life now i i will still have drinks mm -hmm. in a social setting mm -hmm. but i'm not sitting in the garage or the basement you know with a fifth of jack daniels you know trying to numb myself yeah. <clears throat> um but yeah you're right nothing good is going to happen nothing is positive is going to come from it it's just. Uh, what do you uh, think about the the use of have you have you heard of anything in the, the psychedelic treatment 
area? Like, are you are you talking to a lot of people that do that? Like, what's yeah, your, I, what's I know several, like the it? the micro dosing and mm-hmm. things yeah. like that. Yeah, I I personally don't I, I don't do it. Yeah, but I do know folks yeah. that have and are currently doing it, and it's been tremendous for them. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not a doctor, but I th- you're not. Just to clarify, <laughs> I, just, I pre- well, yeah. So, but I think in a controlled setting, a controlled environment, mm-hmm. um, there probably is some benefits to it. You know, I veterans, athletes, a lot of people are are doing it. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I can only assume that it's helping a lot of people. I, um, yeah, I've. I'm interested to see like from, you know, peer groups because I've seen a lot of people it, it help. I've also seen a lot of people now they've been turned on to them, but then they, they've, they're also using them more recreationally yeah. than anything, which it, right. okay, that's going to happen. Like right. statistically, anytime you do something like that, it's going to happen. Right. I do see a significant amount of people like it, it does say that, well, and this is like a, a study of like one and me talking mm. to multiple people like, yeah, it seems to help. And I know that like my, my business partner, Jared, went down to Mexico and did um, Ibogaine and a, with a few other people. Uh, and I know that like they've done a lot as far as like right. ketamine and Ibogaine and, and ayahuasca and some of these others that are like really substantially helping people's right. lives. Um, I know... I think, and my theory is the younger you are when you're exposed to combat, Mm -hmm. when you're still developing brain, which is like, I think that's part of the reason why I think I've been able to kind of deal with it. I think psychologically and emotionally more, more, um, more appropriately is like when you're 18, 19, 20, your brain's still like growing. Yeah. And it's like, I was, you know, 26. Right. So, and, and you know what? That makes perfect sense. I mean, I I was twenty years old. Yeah, you know, still developing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I totally makes sense. Because um, I I do. Not that you know, mental mental uh, health injuries that uh, it doesn't discriminate. But you're right. Now that I think about it, uh, some of the older folks that were, you know, higher ranking or whatever, they were still in the shit. Mm -hmm. But I I feel like they've dealt with it and they've done better adjusting. And I think so. I I think I've seen it and I've seen most the older guys that have dealt with it. They've been able to deal with it. Right. And the guys that have been like when they got real, like, 18, 19, 20, right. and then they did lots and lots of reps. Like, whew, man, those guys are set right. up for right. s- some significant fallout. Yeah. yeah. And then, like you said, you throw the alcohol, you know, the Can't. booze or whatever, you know. Yeah, you mix, you mix some THC and some alcohol in there on a, re- on a standard repetition, like, right. you know. It's like a it's like a punching bag. Yeah, it's like a rhythm of like THC and alcohol on top of each other, uh, with we'll call it you know bad sleep, you yeah. know like drug dependence, and then right. you add some painkillers and a few of these other uh, things. Yeah. Now you have a, a significant toxic <laughs> stew in there that is not a recipe so, for success. Yeah, definitely a recipe for disaster. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> when you when you wrote your book, like what what were you? Yeah, you talked about the reasons why, mm-hmm. but what do you cover in your book? Basically, uh, deploying mm-hmm. the experiences in Fallujah, everything that happened, but a lot, a lot of it's coming back and my experiences navigating and dealing with my own uh, PTSD. Right. You know, um, I was there for a while. I, I mean, I was. Bad, really? Yeah, I and I and I feel like PTSD it evolves and it changes. Like for me, when I was twenty one and diagnosed, I was still having nightmares, uh, different. But it has changed. I don't have nightmares now, right? 
Um, I just don't sleep now. Right. Where, um, hypervigilance yeah. was there before. Now it's not. I'd, right. It just changes. And quite honestly, I feel like you you figure out ways to, to cope and mm. live with it. Right. I mean, you, you control it. You don't let it control you. How and it's you- easier said than done. But for me, having children, that was as jacked up as I was. When my son was born, it was like, okay, this this is a game changer. Right. I have to be present. I have to be clear-headed. I, I have to be there for this little boy. Mm-hmm. And that's really, I think, what turned me around was the birth of my kids. Uh, you th- For me personally, like I said earlier, throwing in, I pray. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't. I'm not running around pushing religion down anybody's throat. I'm not, you know, you need to be a church. I, I don't know. Oh. Right. I just, it soothes me. It makes me feel better. It calms me down. I, right. And if it works, lean on it. Yeah. You know. So, but yeah, because a lot of people, I think people were expecting it to be like just a war book, like a story yeah, yeah. of war, but it's. Yeah. There's that, Mm -hmm. but it's coming back and the hurdles and, uh, you know, almost like running, you're walking in the sand, two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward. And that was my life for, it felt like five, six, seven years was, man, it's like there's a record playing and there's a scratch in it Mm -hmm. and that needle just keeps hitting, you know, that same scratch. It's like, how do I... I got to get over it. Like, mm-hmm. I'll never forget what happened, nor should I. That's part of my life. That's part of me. Yeah. But I have figured out ways internally, whatever's around, my wife, my kids, whatever. I learned to control it and not let it control me. Mm-hmm. And I wish I could rattle off an answer and say, this is how you do it. Mm-hmm. I just can't. That's the hard part. Um, it's like, um, you know, some of the things I've, I've kind of learned is like once I was psychologically at ease with dying, when I went to combat, I was like, Oh, cool. Like, okay, so this is the deal. You're not going to get out of here alive. Cool. I I was way easier. It was way easier for me to cope with what was happening. Like those were all the things that were going through my head. Like I, I, I assumed I would die. Right. And then I, the things I worried about were, were, wasn't, it was like, wasn't death. It was, okay, well, I'm going to be missing a limb and which limb is, a, which limb right. is it going to be? So you're like, ah, oh, man, I hope it's not my fucking, my right hand. Cause I love jerking off, you know, or say, <laughs> you know, like that's the conversation you're right. having. And yeah, man, uh, you know, coming back, I'm like, well, um, I just kind of like, and I think the last few years it's been good because I think Iraq is, it, it, once you, you accept that one, you're alive and two, like Iraq or your war will be with you every day for the rest of your life. Right. You just accept it. Right. You'd be like, Hey man, shit's going to be there. Is, okay. You know what? I'm not going to solve any of it anytime soon, but I got the rest of my life to figure it out. But right. today I got to be a good dad. Right. And that, that, that's spot on, you know, when you're really down, when you're at rock bottom, sometimes life can be minute to minute, mm-hmm. hour to hour. And if that's what it takes, and this is what I tell people, hour to hour, let this next hour be a good hour mm-hmm. and then build upon it. Small small victories, you know, because there are, you know, there are people that, if they make it another hour, that's a great thing. That's, that's huge. How, you know, that's how bad off they are. Yeah. And it's just, you know, I, I, hell, I, I don't know that I was ever that bad, but, you know, I wrestled with my, my issues and, um, you know, like in boot camp, it's like morning chow, lunch, dinner. Yeah. That's, I never saw a clock or anything. I didn't know what time it was. <laughs> so that's how you got through the day. Yeah. 
one thing, you know, I was like, okay, phew. I made it through half a day. I'm having a good day. And here comes my kids. You know, I was like, damn, I got something to live for. I, I, I have to be here, and I got to be clear-minded, and I, I just, my kids deserve this. They deserve the best of me. So, but there are, you know, there are those young, young guys out there. They don't have families. They don't, mm-hmm. and they're. Those the guys I worry about. And how are they dealing with it? With a bottle of Jack Daniels mm-hmm. or, you know, and then that's what scares you. That's what worries you. And I tell them all, call me. I'll talk to you. I don't care if we're on the phone for five hours in the middle right. of the night. I'm here. You know, we, we've all lost. I just lost a great friend. You know, we just buried him in Arlington. And it's like, God, why didn't he call? Why didn't I call? Mm -hmm. It's like, shit. You know, you just. I think it's like a residual from our, what we were talking about earlier, which is it's cultural conditioning to not say anything because you don't want to lead on that you might have a a chink chink in the the armor. armor, Yeah. It's, and that's, that's how we're built. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how our mind is configured you know, there's a reason that we went to the military there's a reason that we chose our MOSs and what we did in the military you know I try to figure out ways to where it's you know this this podcast is like part of it it's like right. hey you feel like you're talking to somebody you feel like you can have a conversation with right. somebody that you now you might have been in the mill or maybe you get a greater understanding as to what it's like in the military but you know, we're, we're constantly trying to support ways that we can go out and like connect people socially, specifically in social events. Like we started this working with these guys, uh, the Veteran Golf Association. They just get out and like play on the right. weekends in different regions and chapters. It's awesome. Right. But it's like, you know, you have the VFW, you've got all these different ver- veteran organizations. I think a lot of these, like like the first step, I think for most guys, and, and not that I'm like, I don't want to preach, is like sobriety. It's like, just just try to be sober. Right. And not, like, I'm not saying like, you got to quit and just be like, you know, a teetotaler for the rest of your life. It's like, no, man, like, like having a coat, you know, everything in moderation. Right. Like, that's what I'm talking about. When I'm right. talking about sobriety, like not drinking at all is not moderation, by right. the way. Like, throttle modulation is like, hey, <laughs> don't get fucking wrecked every night. Like, right. hey, that's pretty easy. Like, or for some people, really hard. It's like right. sobriety. Like, you know, like eliminate the 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 drugs out of the system mm-hmm. so you can have at least what what I say is like a, a clearly Clear. functioning mind. Right. And then like figure out a social, like a, a social connection point right. where it's like maybe it's the VFW, maybe it's the right. BGA, maybe it's like fucking bowling. I, I don't know, man. Right. Oh, art classes. I don't know. Like figure out ways that not only you can socialize with other veterans, but then pick up a different skill. So that's one of the reasons why we skydive. It's one of the reasons why we shoot bows. It's one of the reasons why we shoot guns. It's one of the reasons like find these socialization points because the, the last thing that you should be doing is like dealing with this stuff alone and isolated. Right. Filling your head with a bunch of booze. Mm -hmm. Like if you're alone, isolated, not connecting with people socially, not learning because that's the other thing It's like, Hey, go, be like, oh, I'm not going to take any classes, man. I'm not going to school. It's like, dude, well, there's lots of different things you could do. Like maybe go try to be a chef or fucking diesel welder, mechanic yeah, or welder. welder. I don't know. Yeah. Like, but if you don't have any curiosity, which is part of depression, right? It's like. It's like, yeah. Do something that brings joy to you. Yeah. You know, whether the, whatever that may be, um, you know, for <laughs> I'm sure you heard. I, I started dabbling in politics. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the hell I'm thinking, <laughs> but um, it. Yeah, what seat are you running for? I forget. <laughs> I'm running for a house seat in Ohio, yeah, uh, 86th district, right? Um, and you know, in 22, I was on the uh, Republican ticket for lieutenant governor. Mm-hmm. Um, we got beat by the incumbent. But <clears throat> what really, and trust me, I hate to lose. Yeah. We all hate to lose. But I met so many good people campaigning. 
I saw every nook and cranny of the state of Ohio, and I thought I'd seen it all. Right. But I've met so many courageous, great people that are, I can they're just, they're patriots. There's no other way to describe them. Mm -hmm. They're tired mm -hmm. of being locked down, you know, when the COVID stuff was yeah. going on. It's like, you know what? These people took their last dime, their last penny to start this family mm -hmm. business. The government comes in, shuts mm -hmm. them down, and lets the big box, you know, yeah. the Walmarts of the mm -hmm. world have record breaking sales. That pissed people off. They will never recover. No. And as I was traveling around meeting these people, I'm like, you know what? Somebody needs to fight for these people. And, you know, I want to be, I don't, I tell, I'm not a politician. Never will be. Don't want to be. But what you get with me is you're going to get a fighter and somebody that's going to do the right thing when nobody's looking. Mm -hmm. And you don't see that in politics. You just don't. I mean, it's a nasty, nasty business, as you know. But if we can get, and if it were up to me, we would fill Congress with nothing but veterans at the federal level and at the state level. Because, you know, we they just tend to be honest, good people. Right. Um, but, yeah, we are uh, we announced our candidacy last Monday. Okay. Um, so we're just getting into it. Um, yeah, it, it's going to be a... When, when, when's the vote? The primary is May. Okay. Uh, yeah. You know, coming up. Yeah. May 6th. Um, there's an incumbent. She's been in... Uh, she's seeking her third term. Democrat, Republican? She's a Republican. Okay. Um, and you know what? I made it very clear when I announced my candidacy this time. I'm, I'm not coming out to bash her mm -hmm. because I think up until recently, she's done a, a fairly good job. She messed up in recent months. A lot of people came to me and said, will you primary her? Mm -hmm. We want a conservative. Right. So I said, you know what? I'm a, I'm a conservative 100% of the time, all the time. I'm not good. And that's what we're... Where, so where did she fail the last few months that you've recognized her shortcomings? So Ohio, we got a, a Republican governor. Mm -hmm. We've got the majority in both the House and the Senate. It came time to vote on the, the Speaker of the House. 99% mm -hmm. of the folks had already internal, they wanted this conservative Speaker of the House. Mm -hmm. The Democrats wanted a rhino type yeah. Speaker. Uh, obviously, they did not have the votes, so they had to get Republicans to flip and vote with them. Right. They call them the Blue 22. There were 22 Republicans that voted with the Democrats. It came out of left field. Nobody knew. I'm still trying to figure out why she did what she did. Hmm. I don't know, but I will find out. Did she explain? Did she has she explained what, what her circumstance or, or her decision? She has tried, but it's like a dog chasing uh, its tail. Yeah, it's, like, it's like politics. It's, bullshit. it's like yeah. who? How much money did somebody? You know, it's like yeah. somebody stroked you a check. Yeah, somebody did something because what you did. It would literally be like Jim Jordan voting for Nancy Pelosi to be the Speaker of the House. Right. What right. she did. Yeah. So people, you know, it's like, I'll be, I'm the guy. Mm -hmm. I will fight for you. I will do what's right. Um, and you know what? We're going to run a, <clears throat> a good, honest, clean campaign and see where, see what happens. You know? What else is, uh, can you identify anything else that she's, Effed up? No, like I said, up yeah, until that point, yeah. I mean, you know, she's right. a big. She was a big supporter of two A. Right. Um, you know, all the conservative things. Yeah. She hit the. She hit the wickets. Hit the wickets. Yeah. And it just leaves you scratching your head. Like, what in the hell happened? How many votes you need? Well, the last couple primaries, I believe she's won with six thousand. Because you know, people don't vote in primaries. No, they don't. They just. Did you vote today for what? You know, I right. just don't have a freaking clue. Yeah. Uh, so, six thousand, you know, sixty five hundred takes it, and in and in our district, if you win the primary, there's no Democrat. Got it. Yeah, you're on. Yeah, I you're, mean, you're you're there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, right. So you're you're gonna pri like they call it primary area. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, whoever wins the primary yeah. will be. Got it. 
That makes sense. And the general in November will yeah. win. I, are you, do you follow politics? Do you like following politics like at federal yeah. and state level? Really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I like wh who's your who's your go to guy? Like when you when you scroll through your feed and you're like that fucking dude, I like that guy. You know, there, there's or a, chick. I don't know. Why. Yeah, um, Jim Jordan is oh, my yeah. federal. Jim's, Jim's funny. Uh, that's my district yeah. where I live. Oh, he is. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, yeah. I like Jim. Yeah. Uh, he was a state champion he's a high lot, school wrestler. He's a lot of fun to watch, man. Yeah, he, he, he is. He, he, that dude can get people fired up. Yeah, I mean, he just it's had, hilarious. Oh yeah, it's like he knows how to motivate me. Yeah, it's like put your head through the wall. Okay, bam. I mean, yeah, yeah, he just has yeah. that nag. It's like I like Jim, um, JD Vance. Yeah, he's really good too. Um, he uh, he just introduced some sort of legislation with this week. Uh, preventing the federal government from mandating masks on airplanes and you know yeah it's like so normal like nor like like logical people like thinking logically you like, on the plane ride here yesterday <laughs> I'm like you don't even have to say it it's so stupid it's <laughs> and you know what it's like I couldn't imagine living in that much fear I I don't know I'm like you do you. Hey, I'm the same and I don't way. Give, and I don't give a shit. If you want to wear that, I don't care. But don't put, I, don't mask our kids no. at school. You know, it, it's child abuse. It really, I mean, it's, it's weird. It's I, just I, easier. It's common sense to me. It, it, it's it's strange to me. Like, hey, man, you want to wear a, an N95 with a face shield because you got a cold? You, you're, doing, you're doing me a favor. That's on you. I don't care. Like, at the end of the day, it's like, I, I can't be... Into when I say this, like, man, I can't be into individual liberty right. and then expect people that if right. they're going to do dumb shit, like, right. okay, dude, that's that's great. That's America, right. man. Like, you do right. you. Like, uh, as long as you're not hurting me, brother, and the, uh, by all means, don't, don't hurt me. Don't hurt any other family, bit yeah. in, in my family. Don't hurt anybody else. Like, you do you. Right. And, and it's like, I don't care what people do in their bedroom. You know, that's a big, another big thing. I, I don't give a shit what you do in your bedroom. <laughs> don't push it onto our children. Second graders should not have drag. No. Drag shows. Yeah. You know, I'm like, stop. Common sense at some point has to prevail. That there's nothing about that that even is remotely sounds normal. <laughs> it, it, not only does it not sound normal, but it's like, hey, I, I, I'm sending my kids to school to be educated right. in math, right. English, science, hard skills. Like these half-baked, like freshman 101, like gender studies conversations don't need to be brought down to the second grade level. Right. Like I don't care. Like to your point, I don't care. You guys do whatever the fuck you want to do. Like right. identify as a tree fog with a fucking umbrella on your head. Right. Don't care. Just don't tell me that I have to teach my kids or that you're going to teach my kids that because that's where you cross the line, dude. Right. That's where that's where it's like, dude. You do you. Like go ahead. Like I'm fucking identify as a table. Yeah. Like, that's cool, man. Like hey, we'll put some glasses on your back. Right. I don't care. Right. Just don't tell me I got to do the same thing in my right. house or. I'm discriminating against right. people if I don't buy into your half-baked bullshit. Right, and I'll tell you, the, the other thing that really just chaps my ass is the whole, if you are a man, you will compete with men <laughs> yes. in sports. <laughs> so easy. You're going to go into the men's restroom, <laughs> because I can tell you, if you try to go into the women's restroom with my daughter, oh, man. I'm Not, whooping somebody's ass. Yeah. I mean, it's... Sick. I mean, I don't know any other way to describe it. But the thing is, in public schools now, they're making 99% of the people cave to the 1%. I'm like, it's total bullshit. There's cat litter boxes <laughs> because people are identifying as cats. I'm like, 
I'm sorry. Oh it's God. like every time I hear this, I just have to laugh. See, because I, and it's I like, thought it was bullshit. I did too. Like, but I was it's like, real. It's, it's real. And it I'm like, is. I'm this like, has got to be like, this has got to be just like internet, like prop, bullshit. like yeah. Russian propaganda or something, right? There's, there's like, they're trying to cause some type of like, no, it's real. And, <laughs> and you're like, that's, come on, man. Like, like if I was in school and some dude was like, meow, I'm a cat. You'd be like, what? <laughs> Are you serious? Like, hey, man. I'm not, I'm not trying to like tell you what to do, but like, you're going to get put to the, like the rubber room for kids, man. Like, <laughs> like you're going to need, like, you're going to need help. Yeah. See, and now the board of education is putting cat litter boxes <laughs> in the, in a, a special uh, closet. Yeah. We need to start investing in like homeschool, fucking oh my online God. homeschooling because it, 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 we, you know this, what? I have I have a whole other theory on this too, where it's like this these this is all like baked up by like uh, pseudo intellectual educators that failed uh, math and science, like <laughs> so they weren't good at actually like when you go get a PhD. And no offense, actually, I don't really give a shit if you're offended <laughs> at all. Actually, if you got a PhD. And and you have it in some like obscure bullshit where it just required you to be a fucking half baked <laughs> philosopher. Sorry, dude, it's not real. It's bullshit. Like, you got to go actually learn how to do math. And the reason you had that degree is because you couldn't do math and <laughs> <laughs> convince me otherwise. And now this is you trying to get back at everybody else that could do math because you're like, look at, I have a real degree. I can drive a national conversation, you know, <laughs> <Right>. look at me. <laughs> you know, it, call me crazy, but reading math, Dude. Uh, science, social studies, uh, that, I'll even I'll even accelerate this like stupid theory that I have on top of it because it's so stupid. I think part of this is because of the education industrial complex, the education industrial system, whatever it is, what you did was you basically opened up federal funding for all the education systems to have an endless spigot of money that's essentially propped up by the federal government on high interest loans that by the way, you can't default on. So now the education system can go, hey, you know what? We can add a bunch of bullshit requirements and we can hire a bunch of half-baked pseudo-intellectuals <laughs> right. to pontificate about a bunch of bullshit where people go, oh, wait, I've got to gobble this stuff up because what? PhD fucking litter box thinks it's a good idea. Whereas like, in all reality, if if you if they made it so you could default on loans, they were high interest loans and you had to fuck like they would tighten the screws on that to mm -hmm. the point of which like if you if you had to have a, a grade requirement mm -hmm. like a grade requirement or you had to graduate with an elevated uh, <laughs> math requirement whatever right. that might be right. i don't know all i know is like it seemed like a lot of this bullshit philosophy started to accelerate itself once they started giving people the ability to escalate more. Like I'm saying people, I'm saying the entire education system right. in general, right. that you had to bake in pre prereqs and then you can't default. Like they can charge you whatever the fuck they need to charge you. Mm -hmm. They're going to, you're going to, they're going to get their, 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 their dollars out of you. Oh yeah. 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 It, it is so bizarre. Yeah. So, <laughs> Thank, thank goodness, my my district that I'm running in, very conservative, farmer. I mean, I, ninety percent of it, it's farm country. You know? mm -hmm. It's uh, patriots out shooting guns, taking care of their families. Don't want to be messed with. Just we're we're doing our thing. We're living the American dream, you know. Um, but you know, you you got the crowd that. To fund the police. Look at Austin. Have you? I don't know if you're following. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's like if some. I just saw yesterday. If you are being robbed or there's a burglary, do not even call nine one one. Call three one one, and we'll put you on the wait list to come investigate your robbery. What? Oh, Yo, this is true. That, that's in Texas. Austin. Oh my god. Because gosh. they were one of the big beating the drum on defund yeah. the police and all that crap. So, what do you get when you defund the police? <laughs> Mass crime. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's a physics problem. <clears throat> Man, Once I, again, they, these guys need to go take physics. <laughs> they need to understand energy. So, <laughs> like they just need to understand like, hey, if I take some shit off of this, it's going to apply more over right. here. It's the way it goes. So, yeah, I, I'm, uh, 
I'm excited. I like I said, I I just want to be a voice for those people. Yeah. I don't care. I'll stand on top of the desk and bang and stomp and shout for what's right because the people deserve that. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to uh, uh, it's just we're living in a very strange world right now and it is. It's a weird world, man. You know, I hell he, I'm only 40 and some of the things that have happened I'd say even in the last 10 to 12 years, it's like, what in the hell? What what year did you get back from Iraq? Four or five? Four. Oh, five. Five? Yeah. So you think about it. 1945 is when the the World War II vets got technically, like we'll just say that's the year. Right. Okay, so 1965 was 20 years later. Mm-hmm. Like you and I are, are you know, I, I – Oh three was the first time I went to war. It's twenty twenty three. It's been twenty years, mm-hmm. and you know, I, I'm basically like the World War II vet that nineteen sixty five was looking at all the hippies going, "What the fuck? <laughs> What's going on out there? What are you guys doing? What kind of bullshit are you guys up to? Like, <laughs> drop out, tune in. Like, right. I don't know, but I'm like, I'm looking at this, and I'm like, what? What do you guys? You guys are you don't identify as anything? You fuck color your hair, whatever absurd color. Like, and to be, to be honest, I'd be like, man, bring back the hippie beatniks. I'm into that way right. more than I am. Like whatever this amorphic, like face piercing, crazy hair, not identify male, female, whatever this thing is going on right now. Like, bro, I, I can get all over this other thing where guys like that, that generation was out, like going to fucking Woodstock and dancing in the mud and taking a bunch of acid. <laughs> that looks Really normal that's to me the, that's, that's <laughs> compared, compared to, to what's what going this on looks like over here. Oh, God. You know, my daughter came home last year from sixth grade camp, and she says, Dad, can I talk to you? I said, yeah, what's up? She goes, there were three furries in my cabin. <laughs> no, really? I said, what do, you, what do you mean? She goes, well, you know, with the showers had uh, shower curtains, and they were crawling around on their hands and knees like pretending like they were peeing and look, <laughs> I'm like, no, really? Yeah. So I, the principal oh who was gosh. a teacher of mine, I'm like, dude, what is going on? And he's like, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they don't subscribe. They're not putting the litter boxes out and all that, yeah. but you know, they got a, they got a guy that thinks that, that wants to be a girl and he's, he is wearing yoga pants to school with his bulge and his junk <laughs> hanging out. And I'm like, <laughs> That is not okay. I don't, my daughter, the, the women, the girls should not have to look at that. It's yeah. absurd. I mean, God, we're living in a banana republic. It's bananas. It is bananas. It's like, it's bananas. And when you're, when you're like, yo, this is crazy, right? Like, <laughs> hey, everybody. <laughs> just, Be, beam me I up. <laughs> I don't know if like we all got like 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 the water system got dosed all at the same time and then some of us were left out of this fucking <laughs> thing and we're like, hey man, I've been drinking bottled water. I don't think I got the same amount that everybody else did. I got to like go back. Is this like a public water system issue or? <laughs> it's like, call me old fashioned, but boys go to the boys room. Girls go to the girls room. Oh, call, call me old fashioned call when, when I, I'm just trying to figure out like, <laughs> hey man, like, you, like black is Black, white is white, like gray is gray, right. yellow is yellow. Like all these colors are real. Like if we start just like throwing around labels and be like, hey, you know what? I'm going to just change around the entire dictionary. It's right. okay. Who cares? Hey, I'm going to call this tree, you know, frog. And we're going to like whatever I want to use. You won't understand anything. Like the premise of language is to have quite li- quite literally an agreement on how we use these these like vibrations that come out of our fucking head. And if we just agree on a set of other things, we're like, hey man, this is wood. Cool. I understand what you're talking about. But if you start using like they, them, her, him, she, and different contexts around different sentences, and you're just throwing around different things, like I have no idea what you're talking about. You're talking a different language and you can only talk with other people to speak that other language. And you know, the really sad, sad thing is the, the military was the last place yeah. where nor- it was things were normal. No matter what was going on outside. Didn't matter. The military is where people went because it was normal. 
And now that shit is bleeding into the military. It's crazy. You know, it's they're, How? they're they're paying for the the reassignment surgeries and this and that. And I'm like, boy. Yeah, I looked at that number the other day because I was interested, and it was like the the you know because that's like a cut talking point. Right. Like there's like 15 people that, that that's happened to. And, and the I'm DOD. Like, yeah, and the yeah. DOD. And I'm like, okay, well, not as bad as I thought it would be. Still from a taxpayer perspective, right. you're like, okay, are these are the things that we really need to be paying for. Like, um, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, honestly, it's really a question open for everybody where it's like, I think once you're like, you're committing to that, shouldn't you be paying for that too? Like, it seems right. like, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't like, I'm, I'm neglected to say some things in the context of like, not because I'm afraid to, it's just like, I know that there are some people, right. There's like a small fraction of people where they have like legitimate, like, like, uh, like, mental health right, right. like very le legitimate mental health right, issues right so i don't like to take away from the entire conversation by saying like well i'm not saying it's entirely devoid Correct. of legitimate conversation right because there is right. and for those people like fuck man like i feel for you because you have a you have a health issue okay right. but i also think there's a part where there, there's a there's a there's a a trend right i don't know i yeah, think there is yeah it, yeah, I, I just, I, I'm a big believer that the, the military is not where we, the social experiments happen out. Yeah, outside. Outside the military. Yeah. It should not, in, in my opinion. Same. It should not be social experimentation inside the military. No. Like whatever is happening outside of the military, like they, to your point, would say, you know, they close and kill, right? So, yeah. well, you know, it, it the military has one, well, I mean, obviously, they have one, one what overwhelmingly defined purpose, which mm -hmm. is to protect yeah. the United States and United States interests abroad. Right. Period. So, okay, you can't do that if you're concerned with whether or not you're a furry, because if you identify as a fucking cupcake or a tree frog <laughs> or a cat, like next week, like how are you going to be mission ready? Because right. you're like, dude, I'm a tree. I can't carry this rifle. I'm growing right. my leaves this spring. <laughs> you know, like. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Ultimately, it just goes against to me mission readiness. Yep, you know, simple as that. I think. I mean, they're the you know good order, discipline. I, I but mission ready. Right. You know. Well, fuck, Jeremiah. It's been good, man. I appreciate you coming out and having a conversation with yeah, me. Is there anything else you me. want to talk about before we roll out? No, I. We covered it, didn't we? I think so. We. uh where can they find you to donate to the campaign? Yeah, uh, workmanforohio.com. Cool. Yeah. Workmanforohio.com. Yep. Um, we, we're in that phase right now where we're yard signs, palm cards, yeah. you know, it, it takes money to run a, a campaign. And um, so that's what we're doing. We're raising money right now. And uh, I'll, I'll be back in Ohio tomorrow and I will be beating on doors. That's great, man. So, well, I'll go and donate right now. Thanks, <laughs> I appreciate man. it, man. Yeah, dude. Appreciate it. Yep.